This ridiculous fighter made fighting world champions look easy. For most of his career, he was absolutely untouchable. So elusive that in most of his fights, he was barely touched at all. You see, Prince Nassim is the rarest type of fighter. The type of fighter who made champions look foolish. In the ring, he did things that no other fighter has ever done. Taunting some of the best fighters of his time. These taunts attracted love from those who enjoyed his cocky swagger, but it also attracted hate from those who admired humble champions. Selling out arenas before his opponents are named, he was a fighter so flashy and so cocky that everyone tuned in. Those who loved him tuned in to watch him school world champions. And those who hated him tuned in to see him stumble. They hoped that the cocky young fighter who called himself Prince would be humbled one day. Whenever he would stumble in the ring, people jumped on the chance to call him a fraud. Would be that the prince was exposed as a fraud. But the prince was no fraud. For all of his flash, there was real substance. When tested, the prince showed a champion's character. Yes, whenever he was in flow, he carried an arrogant swagger no fighter has ever carried. But this was also a man considered as one of the most talented fighters of all time. The next Muhammad Ali. A featherweight capable of doing things no one else could. This was highlighted by the fact that he barely did any road work and skipping long fight camps during his championship career. That's a golf shot, boy! And yet, this boxer had a prolific reign and during his prime, he often made one of the hardest sports in the world look easy. Fight fans, welcome back to another episode of Striking Breakdowns. In this episode, we feature Nassim Hamed, the legendary boxer they called Prince Nassim. If you look at my style, it's totally different, extraordinary to any other. From the very beginning of a fight to the very end, Nassim was always a showman. Naz had epic entrances and epic somersaults into the ring. But what truly made him stand out wasn't the show he put on outside of the ring. Inside of the ring, Naz was truly special. Often doing absolutely outrageous stuff, the type of stuff that no one else has ever attempted before. Dancing with his hands down, mouth wide open, and chin up. He fought like he was invincible. And his athletic talent and technical prowess backed it up too. Naz could often switch stances and snipe the opponent from long range. He could dodge punches like no other. Evading at creative angles that no boxer has ever attempted before. But he wasn't just a defensive genius. He had finishing power on each and every attack he threw. Whether it's a jab, cross, hook or uppercut, he had knockout power in every single strike. Even more impressively, he can attack from both stances and have finishing power in both stances too. Carrying an incredible 84% knockout ratio, the Prince possessed a one-punch knockout power, an extremely rare trait for a featherweight. Naz was so fast that sometimes he could literally sprint into one of his punches and the opponent would not be able to do anything about it. Fighting him was humiliating, as everyone would instantly be turned into a highlight reel. For this reason, many champions refused to fight him when he looked invincible. In many of his earlier fights, Naz ran through opponents hardly being touched at all. So how was this flashy but effective style developed? Growing up small and fragile, Nassim's father was worried about him being weak, so he signed him up for boxing. But his supposed weakness turned out to be an advantage, especially under great coaching. With an extremely high dexterity and flexibility, Naz proved too quick for his opponents and amassed a stellar amateur record of 62-5. All of this was aided by a legendary boxing trainer named Brendan Ingalls, a coach who made sure to perfect fundamentals from both stances for the many great fighters he coached. With fundamentals mastered since a young age, 
and the coach also allowing creative freedom, Prince Nassim's style was born. Most coaches would scold at the fighter dancing in front of the heavy bag with his hands down throwing punches from the hip. But at Naz's gym, this was welcomed as long as a fighter can prove that it is effective. Instead of hands up defence, they relied on footwork, vision and their reflex for defence, leaving the hands open for pure offence. You see, to be innovative, a coach has to encourage a fighter's creativity. Many of Nassim's amateur losses were due to disqualifications from him being too outrageous, but that wasn't a problem for Ingle. After winning 9 titles in the amateur circuit, and with no interest in the Olympics, Naz turned pro at 18 years old and started knocking everybody out. By his second fight, he was already selling out arenas and he absolutely loved the attention. Constant stance switching and crazy leanbacks were commonplace in a fight with the Prince. There was rarely a dull moment when Nassim was fighting. 11 professional fights later, after knocking out nearly all of his opponents, Naz was ready for the European title challenge. Within the first few seconds of the fight, he scored a big knockdown. Naz landed what would later be known as his signature blitzing jabs, and this beautifully sets up his killer left cross. Out of his entire arsenal, perhaps the most effective strike was the crazy fast jabs. At times, Naz looked like he was fencing with a spear. Other times, he literally ran in with a punch, which is typically a textbook sin. However, running punches were effective for the Prince. Because he was so unpredictable, and so blindingly fast, that his opponents simply couldn't do anything about it. His incredible accuracy scared his opponents so much, that just fainting a jab could send his opponents running back. After the European title, Nassim would win the WBC international title and defend it five times. Then only three years into his professional career, at the age of 21, he got the big call for a real world title, the WBO featherweight title fight against Steve Robinson. The prince was ready to become a king. And so he did, making the world champion look foolish. Steve Robinson is someone who won the world title and then defended it 7 times before meeting Nassim. But when he faced Naz, the champion was thoroughly taunted. Danced around on, and eventually knocked out. Wearing leopard shorts with the king emblem, on this night, the prince became king. And after this fight, Robinson was never the same again. On this night, the world learned that Prince Nassim wasn't just a flashy fighter, he was the real deal. From the years 1996 to 2002, Nassim became a true megastar, earning an inflation adjusted $150 million, with one of the highest ratings in television viewership. He took England's boxing to new heights, and during his reign, he put on several epic fights for the fans. His first title defence was just ridiculous, flooring the opponent with the first punch he threw. Then when the opponent got up, he finished the fight with the second punch he threw. In his following title fights, Naz showed the world that he could handle true adversity and win tough fights. Even after being knocked down in multiple fights, Naz would always come back and win in spectacular fashion. Whenever he had a tough opponent, Nassim would get wobbled and still come back to knock his opponent out. In what would be Nassim's biggest fight, and toughest opponent to date, Nassim faced the American Kevin Kelly, a world champion who was 47-1. The American floored Nassim in the very first round, and in round 2, Naz got knocked down again. Right when the commentators started to doubt the prince and call him a fraud, he turns it around and knocks down the American champion twice in the same round. Kelly was down as yet. I think the mistake he made, there we go, right, right there. There's the power. <laughs> in round four, Naz dropped Kelly again early. But taking some leather in return. Down goes Kelly on two hard left hands. 
The fight was about to be won, and in a weird moment, the referee would put a count on Naz for being off balance. This encouraged the American champ to chase after him, and in return, Naz replied with a stunning knockout blow. This time, Kelly couldn't answer the bell, and the premier HBO commentators confirmed that Naz was the real deal. Ahmed, say to Kelly, you're the best I ever boxed, and I'm the best you ever boxed. Whoa. <laughs> by winning this fight, Nassim was recognized by the Americans as a real fighter with a champion's heart. Now he was not only a superstar in the UK, but also a superstar in America. After winning another six title fights in two years, all with HBO, many fighters were turning down the opportunity to fight with the Prince. This is what the great George Foreman said. This is some kind of champion who sits and offers his title available and all the contenders say no. It's unheard of. Mm -hmm. And for good reasons. He has power in both hands and he has the eyes of an eagle. All of it looked like a spectacular rise by any standard. The Prince was set to become a true king a fighter who could go down in the history books as one of the greatest of all time. But if fight fans paid attention, they would notice that his style started to change. You see, after Nassim had won the world title, he stopped running and doing the drills that his legendary coach prescribed. He could no longer flow as easily as he did earlier on in his career, and the untouchable fighter became more touchable as his career progressed. The truth is, the relationship between Nas and his coach deteriorated over time. It was a well-documented fallout with both sides publicly attacking each other. Money and fame became Nassim's god, Coach Ingle said. With both sides hurt by the words shared against each other, by 1998, the pair completely split. In four fights, Ingle said that Nassim would be done. The prophetic coach even wrote a letter to Naz. Ingle wrote that Naz needs to learn to be kind to people on his way up because he's going to see them on his way down. After defending his title four times in two years after the split, the prophecy came true. Nassim was no longer flowing beautifully in his fights and for the first time in his championship reign, rather than knocking out his opponents, his fights were going the distance. Without his incredible coach and teammates, Naz was about to face the toughest test in his career his next fight was against a true legend of the sport, Marco Antonio Barrera. Hamed was 35-0 and, and at 27 years old, he had already defended his world title 15 times. These two fighters were considered the two best of their weight classes at that time. Normally an aggressive combination puncher, Barrera instead became a patient counter striker. Rather than pursuing Nassim like so many fighters do, Barrera let the savvy one-punch hitter come to him. Throughout the fight, the Mexican wobbled the Prince multiple times. It was a competitive match, but Naz was clearly losing. Not only did he lose on accuracy, he also lost on volume. Although he never went down, Naz did get wobbled multiple times. Where other fighters would rush in after wobbling Nassim, Barrera stayed patient. The patience was trained because they knew Naz was dangerous when he's wobbled. You see, very specific counters were implemented against Nassim's best attacks. It all paid off, and for the first time, the heir to the boxing crown has been dethroned. Naz was gracious in defeat, saying that he accepts the loss and would be happy to rematch. It's written from Allah for that to happen, and, I'll t and I accept what is written, that's all I can say. The fact, the fact is, I got in, the guy boxed, probably better than me tonight and that's it. There was a rematch clause, meaning that if Naz wanted it to happen, it would have. A year later, Naz had one comeback fight and captured a vacant world title against the journeyman. But the big fights were off now. Due to negotiation problems, Naz had a falling out with HBO. In the comeback fight, although Naz dominated the fight, the fans booed the lack of action throughout. He no longer looked himself, the pundits would say and he blamed it all on his injured hand. In any case, this was Nassim's last fight, and his ex-coach Brendan Ingle had predicted, Naz was done. At the young age of 28, where fighters normally enter their prime, the prince retired without ever becoming the king he was capable of becoming. Many believed that unifying the throne was his destiny, but as fate would have it, it was not. 
Nassim never had to worry about money ever again for the rest of his life, and he inspired generations of fighters for decades to come. His influence in boxing was tremendous, even extending to fighters like Tyson Fury, Conor McGregor, and Israel Adesanya. But perhaps the greatest tragedy of the story was his falling out with Brendan Ingle. You see, Ingle never forgave him, even as Hamed deeply wanted to reconcile. In 2018, Ingle passed away. It was easy to tell how great this man was by how his champion spoke about him. Yeah, Brendan, an amazing guy. Uh, two years away, two years away, he passed away. But as a youngster, a great influence. This guy was so smart. <clears throat> our gym wouldn't be our gym if it wasn't for him. Many pundits argue that Nassim was never really that great, that he was a fraud trying to be Muhammad Ali. Ironically, in moments of great wisdom, George Foreman was the one who actively defended Prince Nassim whenever commentators criticised him. I don't think he likes him, George. I don't think you like him much yourself, Jim. I like him fine. I think I, I have no problem you with said, that. You've said some things, I don't think you like the guy. You should be careful yourself. But the Prince of Boxing was never a fraud. He was exactly what he called himself, the Prince of Boxing. Naz lost against one of the greats of his time and did not go on to prove his greatness in the face of defeat, like many others before him had. That is, Muhammad Ali's legacy was cemented by coming back to beat George Foreman after already losing twice in his career. Foreman's legacy was cemented by coming back and winning the title 20 years after losing to Ali. Nassim's legacy, on the other hand, was a historic rise, followed by an early retirement. Legal troubles followed soon after too. One has to wonder who Nassim would have been in the history books if he and Ingalls never fell out. No matter what, the Prince gave us spectacular fights and spectacular comebacks during his bouts. And as a fight fan, that is enough. The responsibility of greatness must be chosen by the ones who bear special gifts. It is their responsibility alone and no one could choose for them. Personally, I only wish that a reconciliation happened with his coach, who Naz saw as his father. After all, a beautiful connection is bigger than boxing. It's not something that money could ever buy. Like Ingle says, fame and glory is just a twinkle in the eye. Fame and glory is only a twinkle in the eye. If you enjoyed this episode, please do watch another episode of Striking Breakdowns. I'm Lawrence Kenshin and thank you for keeping our channel alive.